uh, for the advocacy class, I was working on a, I call a advocacy rubric for risk, and I called it several things as I renamed it. Should come out as a horizontal with all the, as a horizontal diagram table with all the parts filled in. And uh, since um, 899 class in, ends this week, I would like those of you just looking at TESOL overall. Uh, three Stooges clock just went off. Boy, am I tired. <laughs> okay, but I'm ready for the news. Um, I just came up with this yesterday on Sunday. And because I've never seen anything to kind of help you decide how you want to be involved with English learners or really with anything. I mean, I've never seen, uh, and I can refine this and refine this. And I'd like your comments on it. But down the left side, I have criteria. The criteria down the left side, uh, well, I put it in stages too. Uh, let's go across the top. Stage one is uh, preschool to fifth grade. Uh, I just put some numbers on here. Uh, stage two would be fourth to eighth grade. These are not separated. I'm, I'm just assuming that stage two is a little more edgy and a little more controversial. So you wouldn't want to try to deal with that with kids that are first grade, second grade. They wouldn't know. Uh, so I'm thinking about the maturity and uh, the other judgment is the maturity of in the attitudes in the town city where you're teaching. So if you're in a super conservative area and you want to deal with, you know, if we weren't talking ESL, if we were talking uh, sexual orientation, that changes all this. So you have to realize that the topic you choose changes it. Um, if we're dealing with uh, something simple like the rights and fair treatment of the disabled, um, not a simple topic, but it's hard to find people that are blatantly and are anti people with disabilities. That's pretty hardcore, so you're not going to see that very much. Stage three, sixth through twelfth grade. And I see the last two stages of dealing with older students for the most part. Uh, these can, the, all these can shift depending on the level of acceptance. And the topic, it depends on the topic, really. Um, for instance, environmental concerns would not be as difficult. There can still be a lot of criticism of environmentalists, but Generally speaking, it wouldn't be hard to convince people that we want to not burn down the forests and we should do things to preserve the environment. And I got to stop for just a second because now my phone is ringing. Okay, I had a little interruption there. Um, so I have the great, uh, the ages across the top and basically that's your judgment and maturity level across the, down the left side are the questions you have to ask yourself. Um, as a teacher, what is your intent? What is your goal for your whatever you're advocating for? For instance, there's a big difference between advocating for a new textbook for your class to help your ELs as opposed to you want the school to develop a new policy to help students who are left behind when their parents are deported. That has been done as well. I know Either there's a policy or they have to make one when it happens. So, so it, it can be all kinds of things we're talking advocacy for. It can be big, small, can be relatively non-controversial, or it can be as controversial as you can imagine. So you have to think, what are my goals? What is it I'm concerned about? What is the level of risk? And you have to, what is that risk? Well, the risk is, Ultimately, will it blow up in your face? Will you lose your job? Is it something you're willing to go to the very edge on or, and over? Um, of course, there are all kinds of things to consider. I mean, who are you going to upset? Uh, is it going to be a matter of developing leverage? Is it a matter of building support in a community? Is it a matter of, you know, if if you get this 
that you're right and that you're going to push it just by yourself, you're probably going to fail. You know, usually things are even good intent is not going to be rewarded. And so that's, that's probably the worst thing is if you think you're a good person doing a good thing and then something negative happens, you lose your job or you get demoted or you get humiliated, et cetera. Um, or you get shifted to a different school. I don't know what could happen. You, you may say, well, that's not fair. So you had a very naive attitude about risk because life is full of risks. Okay, what is your, now my next category here, the advocate's knowledge and preparation. Do you know what you're talking about? Uh, if this is uh, advocating that you use the TPR approach, total physical response to teach ESL in the school and you want it everywhere, or you want to advocate for teachers to have more freedom to move away from the prescribed um, teaching lessons, et cetera. You got to decide, do you, um, how are you going to handle this? Um, do you know what you're talking about? Do you, are you aware of the student's background? Do you know if what you're going to advocate is going to work in the first place? Have you done research? Have you looked at other schools? Have you looked in professional organizations? Have you got advice from people? Uh, are, you know, a lot of people come along and they want to advocate for something they th saw worked in another school, and they may not have a good idea about it, but think it's going to solve all the reading problems or all the math problems. And this, and if you happen to be the curriculum director, you might have a lot more authority pushing that or the superintendent. On the other hand, if you're a third year teacher who still hasn't been received equivalent of tenure, then it's going to be much more difficult. You're going to have to be much more persuasive. So what I'm asking in that category is, do you know what you're talking about? Do you have the skills to advocate for it? And maybe say that could be a different category, but I, I just built this in about three hours. It wasn't a it wasn't a long research thing. I've thought about it for a long time. Now, uh, third level, advocate must know the audiences. Do you have a good idea whether you can get support inside this school from peer teachers, from some of your administrators, some of the higher ups, for instance? I mean, if you know the superintendent's for it, even if the principal's not, um, you have to gauge that it may upset the principal if it's imposed on him and you're a part of it. That's where it's just strictly politics, local politics generally. Um, is your school and community open to these ideas, whatever they would be? Um, so I'm going to give examples. Say so all of these are kind of mushy and unclear because when we look at the framework, we're looking at very general view and then when we get in specifics we have to move around okay the fourth one and the last one are advocates choice of concepts and issues in school and community and what is it you're going to be pushing or what is it you're going to be standing up for are you standing up for equal uh, equal and fair treatment of your say african refugee students as compared to other students in the school? Is there inequity there? Is there a violation? Um, now, you know, we talked, I, I talked about in the advocacy class, we talked about the law. And I think I talked about a little bit in the, in the TESOL uh, class. But just because you have civil rights laws, um, they're not being applied directly to your school by someone who has absolute authority. That happens when you have civil rights and you have an ACLU or you have someone has an attorney that represents a group. Um, all you would have to look at, and you could think about this, is what was the history of the, um, of the evolution of law in special education? You know that it was a very slow process. 1969, somebody didn't just come up and say, okay, we're going to, a lot of the, the whole complexity, the laws, the regulations, the practices, uh, the good practices that 
that are taught to special education teachers and, and those that deal with specific things like autism or, or severe disabilities, all that, that, that structure didn't even exist then. Um, I can recall that. I know, I know of situations going back in the 80s in Oklahoma where there were students with uh, debilitating brain um, syndrome or disease in which the, it was so sad, the young boy, as he got older, he became more and more disabled and more and more difficult for the school to provide, serv to pr provide services to. And so the school was always fighting the mother on this. So she spent her time at the superintendent or the central office getting, trying to get all kinds of support she could get. And all for the sake that regardless of what's going to happen to her son, she wanted him to have every fair opportunity as long as he was alive. That was her goal. And it was tough. Um, and you'll find some states where they're much more willing to resist in, in lo localities where individuals may not want to provide services, etc. And to throw in English as a second language, you have people that are very anti-immigrant or anti-refugee or belligerent racist per se, just flat out. And of course, you're dealing with them trying to get equity. And of course, they're saying things like, well, why should we provide these services? Well, we know the court decided they will provide those services, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. So let's look at these stages. Stage one across the top. I just provide, you can change these. I mean, I'm, I'll change them too. What do you do in the first stage? Well, usually you want to acknowledge facts. You want to acknowledge that you have an immigrant, a country built from immigrants, a country that continues to be built from immigrants, may include refugees. The, you can talk about the Statue of Liberty, or you can talk about people desperately crossing the border right now. You can talk about how they treated. You can see how the Japanese and Asians in, the, in our textbook in the 325 course, how they were mistreated. You can see how um, that things were not fair and social justice was not, was not, uh, was not practiced. So maybe you want to just simply teach some facts about some basic things. You, you don't want to get into super controversy. You don't want to say, oh, the U.S. government was uh, deliberately um, caused the deaths of whatever. Usually you're dealing with kids and, or a community. So when I, I had this in the first grade, uh, early childhood to fifth grade, I'm really thinking, uh, something that's not controversial. Um, but it gets complicated because if you just teach about the pilgrims and the Native Americans in the first Thanksgiving, did that actually happen? I have to honestly say that I've never really considered or studied the first Thanksgiving. I don't even know if any of it's true. I know something happened, but what was it exactly? And when you get into the nitty gritty details, that's what makes these things all fuzzy and difficult. So you may want to, you know, typically people have some of the kids dress up and wear some kind of Native American outfit. That, that would be incredibly naive to do in many, many school districts. Um, but in your school, it may just be just fine. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna sit here and, and tell you that a school in, in uh, southeastern South Dakota or southern Indiana is going to be the same as an urban school district in Philadelphia or Boston or a, or maybe a maybe a rural district outside of San Francisco. You're going to have different uh, belief systems. You're going to have a whole different set of attitudes, traditions. You're going to have a different type of person and community there. Um, let's see. Um, then the ones across the top, you know, stage two, you want to also provide empathy. You want to, but you also, I, my thought here is you want to teach some skills so kids can actually learn facts and stories on their own. You're not just 
providing them some information. You're actually asking, and the reason I put the word research and controversy is the kids will find that things are not a nice, clean stereotype of what the first Thanksgiving was or how Native Americans got along with the pioneers on the Oregon Trail. The biggest part of all this is that our history is full of all kinds of notions, stereotypes, if you want to call them, even lies, that we've been told or that we believe which do not honor the truth. Um, you know, that's a pretty bold statement, I think, you know, that, that a history book is written from a certain perspective. And whoever writes the history books is someone a long time ago said, well, whoever wins, they're going to write the history. And therefore, it'll all be justified. We know that a lot of things we find carved in the Egyptian pyramids and on parchment and Roman Empire and all kinds of stories. It was told by the people that won and did whatever they wanted with the enemy. So we might read things that say a lot of bad stuff about the Carthaginians that the Romans defeated, or that uh, the people in Gaul, the French, who for a long time fought Julius Caesar and were finally crushed by him, uh, terrible things. They were massacred and everything else. But the Romans presented as a great victory. This was just natural. This was the natural order of the world. They were to be superior. You can find that attitude over and over. British, French, uh, Asian history of all the major empires, whatever happened, happened, if you win, whatever happened was for the best. Pins, you, do you want to go into a third grader and try to teach that concept? That's probably, probably not going to work in most situations. Okay. Um, the next stage are you explore the controversy. Stage three and four is the difference between individual students, small groups, exploring and discussing bad things that happened. The incident at Wounded Knee, which most people would call just a massacre at Wounded Knee. Uh, if you don't know about Wounded Knee, 1890, um, I would say Lakota, but I can't swear to the tribe. But uh, American cavalry people panicked and shot and killed about 150, 200 Native Americans who were not fighting them, but simply performing some ceremonies, some ghost dances that were perceived by the cavalry as prior as as the beginning of a uprising. And so you can find if you go to Wounded Knee, you'll find, you can look up the facts reasonably on the internet. I'm not a expert on Native American pioneer conflicts in history. I, kn I know what I believe about it, but I can't attest to Wounded Knee very well. I know the Little Bighorn a lot more detailed about that. Okay, and then uh, I think when you get to the fourth stage, and this is not a stage that some of you will want to go to. You may not want to go to the third stage, as, as the reason I made this is you have to realize there is a natural possible progression and people may get upset and say, oh my gosh, there's an oil company in town and oil businesses are doing all these terrible things. And I think that the student council or the history class should go down and write letters and to the editor and criticize and attack this company, even though they provide half the jobs in town. I think you get my drift on this. So those are things that have to be considered ahead of time. Um, now, am I saying that, well, you shouldn't ask too many questions? Well, a lot of people would say, yes, let's don't, let's, what's the old expression? Let sleeping dogs lie. At least I think that was the one that would apply here. If things are quiet, let's let them stay quiet. Perfect example. Uh, recently, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, people have been wanting to research the Tulsa race riots of the 1920s. You have probably never heard about these, but in the 1920s, after World War I, there were several incidents in which people rose up and white people totally destroyed 
black areas of major cities or villages or towns that were um, settled and, and populated by African Americans. One of the worst race riots was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, I, as I remember, there was some incident of an accusation against a black man from a white woman. This is just my recollection. You'll have to look up the Tulsa race riots. But, um, but a very profitable, a very um, enterprising African-American section of Tulsa, Oklahoma in one or two days was burned to the ground. People were killed. Uh, a lot of people that from the black community were never found again. They disappeared. There was a mass grave. And I remember they started investigating this a few years ago and the mayor of Tulsa and a lot of people in Tulsa did not want to revisit this. They said, let's sleeping dogs lie. Let's don't, let's don't talk about the ugly parts of history. Another situation, they found uh, bodies of African-Americans in a part of, I think of Houston, if I remember right. And what they found was that uh, when people, when there was no longer slavery, people would charge African Americans with all kinds of uh, crimes, convict them because they were in a white court, and then sentence them to be laborers and uh, basically to work as slaves for the city or for the county or whatever. And so they, they put them back in enslavement, but they claim they're serving, a, they had committed a crime of some sort. And if you connect this, you can connect this to the large scale. Um, and, and incarceration of African Americans today and make a legitimate claim that there's a history of how African Americans have been treated. Now, obviously, if you get into that area, you're going to be in stages three and four. Um, if you're in a town where this, this uh, becomes a major topic, it could be extremely volatile, yet it may be the truth, okay? So I understand when I give you some of these examples, I'm pretty much clear, you know, that I'm accurate. But the fact is, if I were going to teach it, I would nail this down as closely as I could. And I would have to think about how do I want to provide instruction, especially for my students that want to go further and want to research and want to ask a lot of questions. Do I deny an inquiring mind? and say, look, we've talked enough about this. Let's don't go on. It's going to be kind of ugly. The fact is there's so much. The treatment of women, the treatment of small farmers by ranchers in the Old West. I mean, I could find all kinds of situations, not just racial. A lot of people get very preoccupied and think, well, you're just going to push a certain agenda. And if I were looking at history, I love, I love history. I would want to look at, uh, or instance, I think a great topic would be to study early African-American uh, agricultural communities in Nebraska, which did exist. Okay, I've heard Overton was first settled by African-American pioneers. I never knew that. I, I found that out by reading some obscure little information about history of the local area and it mentioned that I had no idea so uh, being a stranger to Nebraska I grew up in Missouri which is a strange place now but there there's so much there um, there's a town called I think it's called Gideon or something like that it's uh, south of the Kansas Nebraska border and it was, it's on Highway 36, if I remember correctly. It's not all the way down I-70, it's not that far south. And it was settled by uh, what they call Buffalo Soldiers, or African-American families connected with the soldiers that served in the U.S. Cavalry. Fascinating. I remember driving by there, it was closed at the time, but it was a little tiny town, there wasn't much there but they had an African-American Buffalo Soldiers Museum that was been kept by people since, I guess, a hundred years. I don't know much about it. I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't able to go and spend time in the town. I think I just was driving through trying to find my way back. I'd gotten lost and I was fascinated by this story. 
I don't know if it's Gideon, but it's something like that. It's kind of a biblical name. Um, okay, so those are little, lots of little interesting, strange stories you can study. Another little town that'd be interesting if you're in Kearney is a place called Doby Town, which is old, near old Fort Kearney, where, where it's at at the park. And people have done some archaeological work out there. That was actually a, it wasn't a Kearney, that was actually a town that people uh, had shops and help people to get their wagons fixed and everything on the Oregon Trail. Lots of peculiar little areas. That's why I like history. It's got so many exceptions to what you think is the truth. Okay, so you're an advocate and you're looking at these. Then I go in and I, I talk about your advocate's knowledge that you need to not only have a moral attitude about what you're going to do, but um, how dedicated are you to what was the old story sometimes people don't want to know the truth or well, that movie uh a few good men you know, uh, uh, jack nicholson tells tom cruise's character he says you can't handle the truth i want the truth you can't handle the truth as if the truth is too much for people and sometimes it is so let's go down and uh Advocates must know their audience, so you have to know the background of the place, um, the customs. And when I say customs, you know, every place has culture. There is no such thing as, we don't have any customs here, we're, we're just here. Everybody has culture. The way they work, the way they deal with other people, the marriage customs, what they believe about their community, how patriotic they are or not. How, how they celebrate the 4th of July, um, their attitude toward outsiders and strangers. Do they dislike people that look different from them? Or are they really paranoid and they just don't trust outsiders, period, who move into town? I remember once somebody told me in, in a little town of Sutton said, they told this guy he'd been there for a few years teaching. They said, well, nobody, you won't really be one of us until you start having kids here. Which really kind of, when he told me that, it kind of offended me. I said, why? You got to have children for them to accept you? Now I kind of think, yeah, that's probably their attitude. See, the, the interesting thing about that is they, whatever attitude they have and you don't like it, you may not like it, but it's their attitude. And so it's part of the culture. You can't go scold people and tell them you need to clean up your act. That doesn't work. Um, so what do you know about the local customs? What do you know about the local, uh, I put in here as you go up, what do you know about how the school teaches certain things? What's the tradition? A big one is sports. The tradition of the school, you know, they don't like it when schools are consolidated and say, I remember one time someone told me in Hildreth and, well, uh, Hildreth and um, Wilcox that, when those two schools reunited, there was a tremendous issue about where all the championship trophies were, would go. And they had to negotiate that because there were a lot of people that had won some of those trophies in that community. And they said, look, I won the track championship back in 1972. And if we're going to come together, I don't want my stuff just thrown away. I don't want my records just tossed. You know, he might be a major farmer there or might be just a local person. So the people have all kinds of interests in the tiniest things that are very important to them. You know, you don't have to be the governor to care about things. You could be the local school board member who's determined that, by gosh, you know, our school's not going to be erased. If we're going to have Wilcox Hildreth, we're going to have it with a hyphen. We're not just going to call it Wilcox. You know, if it's Smith and Barney getting together, you don't you don't just throw out Smith and say we're going to call it Barney High School or something. Um, so in looking at this, I'm trying not to just dwell on ESL because we're dwelling on what we're looking at as cultural practices here. So you have to know the local, and you have to explore that because you propose stuff. If you propose something to help English learners, but somehow it's going to offend the local 
native population, whatever it is, not, not Native American, but I just call it the native population. People have been there for a hundred years since their parents arrived, great, great grandparents arrived as migrants or settlers. Um, so you try to go out and test things, you know, they call them trial balloons. You ask people some ideas and see what things might be okay and what might not be okay. Um, for instance, here's a good one. Schools get a school, I mentioned it in my video when I was talking to people on the Zoom session today, which went really well, at least I think it did. And uh, a school was, um, undergoing a lot of change, a lot of Hispanics, and then eventually you had a lot of Africans, not African Americans, but Africans. And so when it came time to have prom, what kind of music are they gonna play? Is it all gonna be Cotton Eye Joe and country music? Is it going to be Nortenia music? Is it going to be traditional Mexican music or Guatemalan music? Is it gonna be popular music? and not traditional Hispanic music? Is it going to be rock music? Because not only do we deal with ethnicities and language groups, we're also dealing with preferences in music. I mean, I grew up in disco in, in the 80s. I love the 80s music. I'm sure a lot of you don't. But if there's a station playing 80s music, I'll listen to that before I listen to modern music which I like some of it, but I like only maybe 10% of the modern music. I think a lot of the stuff's pretty stale. And it's reminiscent, you know, you grow up listening to uh, uh, Billy Idol, if anybody knows Billy Idol, a Rebel Yell and White Wedding Dress and, and Dancing in the Dark. No, maybe that's Bruce Springsteen. I get them mixed up. Yeah, that's Bruce Springsteen. No, not crazy about him. But if but if you grew up at a certain time, you liked the music at that time. Okay, uh, modern country music does nothing for me. I, it all sounds the same to me. I liked country music when I was a little kid. My parents listened to it. I thought it was very unique. But I could never sell that to you because you don't like it. It'd be like me telling you that peanut butter ice cream is the best ice cream in the world. Nobody else, you know, very few people care for it. They want strawberry, vanilla or they want gummy bears in it. Yeah. Um, so you have to know the local culture to see what it will tolerate. Um, this is difficult to do. This is why you as an advocate really need to have a nice circle, a nice, with some depth of local people, I didn't even put it in there, of local people and things that you're proposing or that, and the better, the more people you get involved with an idea, the more, um, more willing people are to accept it or at least try it out. The last thing you want is an individual. I remember there was a principal years ago in a small school, not a small school, but average school, and she wanted to show a feminist aspect of the Oregon Trail. And I remember listening to, to faculty members, men, saying, yeah, they want to know what women did on the Oregon Trail, you know, like, that's her agenda. She's a liberal and all this stuff. And I thought, well, I can tell you that it was, the Oregon Trail wasn't a bunch of men doing all the work. There are women on the Oregon Trail. So her point is well taken. But there was a lot of pretty sexist attitudes that this female principal doesn't know anything. And I have to be honest, my, my opinion was that it was just a bunch of guys who didn't like to be told what to do by a female principal, you know. And she was very good at it, but she didn't last very long because they found every reason to criticize her, even though she promoted e equity and, and fairness. And, you know, they didn't even talk about gender orientation. That was in the 90s. So that had not really become an issue. So it wasn't even the more controversial things now. Uh, Okay, so as you look at this, as you go into the, you know, higher levels or more advanced advocacy, more, li it could be liberal, it could be conservative, I I'm saying different. When we're moving left to right, we're going into more controversial things. 
So, um, for instance, um, you could have a weird situation where a bunch of people that are very conservative move into a more liberal district and they want to do some things with their church in the school. They want to use some of the prayer around the flagpole of whatever. And then people get all upset and say, you can't do that here in our school. And then, you know, school law doesn't just coldly say that, no, there'll be no mention of religion or anything else. Our country's always compromising over this, trying to figure out what to do. Um, usually it's something like the, the speech at the graduation or um, a prayer at the what do they call that? Con not convocation, but before the kids graduate, they usually have a, kind of a, I would call it a spiritual meeting of one sort or another. And then people yell around, who's going to talk? And what is there going to be a prayer? Is it course? Things like that. And so uh, you're going to have communities where people have their prayer and nobody complains about it. So my opinion, just my opinion, is you try to find out how the local people live and you try to educate the kids about the world, but you don't try to tear down belief systems. Uh, you have to be careful with that. R regardless, liberal, conservative, religious, not particularly religious or not religious at all, that you have to be very respectful of the way people have built their town and when you want to make changes to, to, to promote awareness of some injustices or some cruelty, you have to be subtle at it. Of course, some people would say, no, you, you just throw it in their face. Well, you can throw it in their face. Um, they might be a backlash and you may lose your job, or it just may create a very hardcore hard feelings between groups. So if you do something that doesn't promote um, understanding and instead promotes conflict, then you really haven't served the community or your students or the staff period. That's, that's my take on. Um, now, some of the issues, I, this is really the one that, you know, in this third one, I talk about understanding the community and their stance on issues. The last one, advocates choice of concepts and issues. Um, first level, I thought, well, how controversial is it to promote equity and fair treatment of those with disabilities? Not too controversial. But if I switch and say someone's transsexual or it's uh, sexual orientation and I do it in first grade, then it gets to be very controversial. Our society does not want to deal with that. Now, if we're in a very urban district, that's not an issue. But you may be in a district where it is an issue. So that's where you become an anthropologist. If you're going to be a, if you're going to be a uh, dealing with cultural differences, uh, you you don't go into a village somewhere where, like anthropologists, and say, "I'm just going to clean this place up." Because that is the height of arrogance. When you go in and say, we're going to straighten this out. We're going to make it fair. We're going to change the roles of men and women. Or we're, um, Such changes have to come. You have to be subtle and delicate. This is not like some political party, radical political group took over an area and said, look, we're no longer going to have a mayor. We're going to have a commissar or something like that. Um, when people feel they're being dictated to, they, they feel they're being oppressed and they're not, not going to be very positive about it. On the other hand, there are places where you'll go where you'll see some pretty rough stuff. That's where it gets dicey and you have to decide how far am I going to go with this. You know, I want you to be an activist. I want you to promote learning and understanding. I'm not really interested in you being a martyr to something whatever direction that is. Um, so I pick things like customs, food, the disabilities, clothing, celebrations. Usually people don't object to a different food, you know. Now if you're serving if you're serving some kind of meat that people never eat, they're going to get very upset about it. Insects, uh, some animal we don't normally eat, uh, 
when I was a kid, don't show this to anybody, when I was a kid, my dad would cook squirrels. Now, I'm sure several of you have never eaten squirrels. They're pretty bony. <laughs> you don't want to kill an old squirrel, you know. It's got, kind of like a furry piece of uh, meat jerky or beef jerky or something. But I remember we had that, and I asked my parents one time, I said, what, what is this? He said, it's too small for a rabbit and too scrawny for chicken. She said, squirrel. I said, boy, that made my tail shake, I'll tell you. Um, but I'd be embarrassed to tell most people uh, that would be considered pretty barbaric and primitive. And you probably wouldn't even, it could be you would not go and eat in somebody's house if you knew they ate things that you didn't per like. Um, what are some other issues under the, are you, well, the concepts are equity, bold, don't be bullies, uh, promote friendship, respect, admiring other cultures. Most people don't get up and say, no, I don't admire other cultures, I hate them. Well, a few people might say they hate them. But uh, that's not too controversial. I'm trying to go from less controversial to more controversial. Uh, as we get over into the second segment, uh, if we'd examine how Native Americans were treated in Nebraska, it's, it's nothing to be proud of. And uh, depending on the time, now right now it may be easier to talk about it. But if we were to be up near Pine Ridge and talk about uh, white clay and the selling of liquor, and alcoholism in Pine Ridge, and how the state of Nebraska did nothing about that until this governor we have now, which is a good thing. Um, a lot of people were ruined. Uh, people would be found dead and frozen alongside the road, having drank themselves to death. Um, that that would be controversial. Whereas such a, dealing with this topic down in Holdridge might not be very controversial at all. But I notice that people that have more, con more, they're in contact with a group where there is stress. If you explore those, the history of those two groups, it's going, it could get pretty rough in the school. Um, African-American, same thing in Omaha. If we address African-American issues um, and we try to address them honestly and deal with uh, have a guy like Ernie Chambers come to the class to talk. If you don't know Ernie Chambers, look him up. Uh, and we talk about uh, um, racial conflicts in Omaha. There's a long history of stuff there, a lot of stress there. And see, that's where you, as a teacher, you have to have the facts. If I were to go and make a big deal and say, I'm going to teach this in a high school where people are gonna walk home and say, teacher said this, then you better be sure that the students have it, have it correct. And also you wanna make sure that it's not you doing the talking, but the facts and the information and the research. It's easy to be a rabble rouser, just get up and make a bunch of statements and tell stories and include mistruths or misstatements and lies or whatever. But um, if you're a teacher and you do that, it gets very tough. Um, gender orientation, LBGQT, uh, religious persecution. Do religious conservatives get treated fairly in the schools? Or is it the other way around? Do they get to dominate? That's an area, could be controversial. Um, other things, you know, mistreatment of women, Attitudes about equal pay. You saw the women's soccer team, they wanted equal pay. All kinds of inequities. Maybe people on a certain part of a town or get the worst school and get the poorest teachers and get, don't get a fair shake. And the difference might be socioeconomic. So anytime you get into this, you have to realize as you go to more controversial and as you arm your students with research and then do critical thinking, they may promote actions that will be blamed on you, even though you simply, you kind of gave them the directions and they went off exploring on their own. So if someone's upset, they may say, well, that teacher, and a damn teacher and a junior, um, a junior or senior high history teacher did this. Or the science teacher's promoting some kind of environmental wacko thing. 
So I just mentioned this little chart here because I want you to think about uh, before you get involved, why are you doing it? Do you know about it? Do you know what's going on in the community or are you just diving in there assuming everything will be fine? And then what is the issue? And you know some issues are going to stir people up and other issues won't. Here's a good one for you. What if I decide that I'm going to do some research and and um, what do I want? Anatomy class, and we want to do research to show maybe that football is too dangerous for high school kids, and there's a high risk of concussions. It can cause brain damage, etc. And that we're all better off playing maybe not even soccer. I've heard soccer because of the hedge headshots. There can also be brain damage there. That running track and playing, uh, I don't know, playing lacrosse or something should be our focus, or softball or baseball. People be very upset. You get the coaches upset saying, well, you got the parents all stirred up. They don't want their kids to play football. And maybe the evidence shows that they shouldn't play football. Think about that. That would be almost anti-American to say football, that kids shouldn't play football. A young boy should not play football. They should play Legion baseball and play something, you know, croquet. Although the way I play croquet, we'd hit each other with wooden balls. We'd hit them so hard. Um, so my argument there is that you can always find, you can always push an art, you can always push a topic that, that will eventually get on somebody's nerves and there'll be backlash. So my hope is that this little, this little thing I've given you is just at least gives you something you can, a guide to what you want to do. Because a lot of people see teachers as just teaching information and not asking too many questions or stirring the pot too much. But in fact, whether you're a minister or a teacher or a local medical doctor or a social worker or a minister or whatever, you may deal with issues that uh, the community is falling short in, mistreatment. Um, you know, if you come up and say, well, the local principal has been intimidating a minority student to try to get him to leave school. And then uh, finally, you decide to help that student, and then you and the principal are, are facing off on it. Um, you're going to be an advocate. You're going to have to be more an advocate than just yourself, um, because there'll be a lot of pressure to make you miserable and to make you back down. Okay, that's all I, I wanted to say about this. I've talked too much, I'm sure. But uh, I wanted to share this with both classes because being an advocate for me in ESL is inevitable. It just depends on how far you want to go with it. Right now with the immigration issues, you decide, do I want to get involved outside organizations? Do I want to do it through my church? Do I want to, you know, go and demonstrate at the state capitol? You've seen that in the pictures. Um, you could be an English teacher and you could get involved in controversial things as well you know there's if you're a human being that pays attention to current current uh current stories and current events you may get involved and uh, it will affect you so i hope this has been of some value